Next, um, we need to rush a little bit, but we do have with us Gillian Campbell, the head of monitoring, review, and reporting at the CBD. She has background in environmental policy and statistics with 15 years of experience in international organizations. In her current role, she leads the work on planning, monitoring, review, and reporting for the UN CBD. This includes overseeing the work on MBSAPs, National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans, national reports that you will keep hearing throughout the week, the monitoring framework of the new framework, and the global analysis of progress towards the framework. Gillian. Sides, I think. We'll see. Um, so I'll just start talking while somebody pulls this up. And I also, I would like to echo all of the remarks that have been made. It's amazing to be here with all of you today um, and, and to bring us into this discussion on how do we better support monitoring of the global biodiversity framework. So I'm going to start by taking a step back and talking about the framework itself. Many of you probably are already familiar with the framework, but it, when I was preparing for today, I wasn't sure how many of you are, were really involved. Obviously, I recognize a lot of people in the room. At the same time, I know that this community uh, is a, a research network, and so maybe not all of you are familiar with the framework or the implications of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. So, fine. Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework has gotten a lot of attention. However, it wasn't the only thing that was adopted at this biodiversity conference here in 2022. Um, there were a number of other decisions. There was 30 different agenda items for COP15. There was a ministerial segment. There were decisions of the different COP MOPs. And all of these together provide a package of what, um, what countries are going to need to be looking at in order to make this step forward towards living in harmony with nature. And the process to get us to these decisions, it, it was very long, um, as you can see. There was a lot of lead up, and because of COVID, we had additional time, and so the package that went forward really provides a robust framework for trying to put us on the right path. And so I think that, as was highlighted by Andy, there's a few decisions that are particularly important for the geobond community. One, of course, is the monitoring framework, where it outlines how monitoring will be done and, and what kind of indicators can be used across the different goals and targets of the framework. Um, but there's also other decisions. And one that I would particularly like to highlight is this mechanism for planning, monitoring, reporting, and review. And this is the decision where countries have really agreed to internalize the goals and targets of the framework. And so the framework was adopted in December, fantastic, but this is a global agreement and action happens at the national level. And so the challenge right now is how do we support countries and how do countries also develop goals and targets that are commiserate with the framework how do they incorporate this into their national decision making? What actions need to be taken? Um, and, and what do they do next? And so this is the challenge right now. And countries have agreed to develop. I'll skip this because I, I know I'm almost out of time. Um, so countries have agreed to develop national biodiversity strategies and action plans by the end of next year. And so then these will be the basis for implementation over the next decade. But as you know, there will need to be responsive and actions will need to be targeted. And in order for countries to have information on where action should occur, on what they should do, um, on how they should do it, how do they measure success and see if what the actions are, what the actions that are taken are creating the intended results. All of this requires better biodiversity monitoring. So this was the idea of the monitoring framework. Is It's not just about measuring global level progress. It's not about forming global analysis. It's about how do we provide guidance to countries and, and who can support countries 
in order to better measure their own biodiversity. And so obviously this monitoring mostly would happen on the ground. This monitoring would involve institutions such as Maria's institution that she was you know, mentioning earlier, and many of you. And so how do you then also make the link between the institutions that are involved in biodiversity monitoring and the policy cycle? This is what this decision includes, but we're not there, and there's a lot of work that needs to happen in order for countries to have access to information, to be able to identify what information they have, what data they have, and what they don't have, and how do you bring this into decision making. And so I think that this community is a, is a starting point for identifying where these data gaps exist, identifying who are the key players who can help fill some of these data gaps, um, and identifying how to leverage communities, how to leverage indigenous populations and data collection, how to bring different people together so that as we move forward, um, there's improved monitoring, but not for the sake of monitoring, but there's improved monitoring for the sake of making decisions, including at the local level, including by individual people, and including at the national level. And so this is the, the idea be behind the monitoring framework. Um, so I. As I said, I know that I'm really short on time, so I'm going to skip some of this. Um, so the, the framework itself includes these four goals. Um, and Andy has mentioned goal A and goal B, which are around ecosystems being conserved, extinctions are halted, and genetic diversity uh, maintained in goal A, and B, which is on biodiversity being sustainable used and its contributions to people are maintained and enhanced and restored. And goal C, but there's additional goals. Goal C is on the benefits um, from the use of genetic resources being shared and sustainably increased, shared equitably, equitably. And goal D, which is on closing the funding gap for biodiversity. And so the targets then match the, this ambition of the goals. And instead of focusing only on sort of key biodiversity threats, they, they do span across different types of information. And I also think that getting research institutions involved in thinking, how do we bring together information on protection, information on restoration, information on invasive alien species, for instance, with also better understanding the risk from pollution, better understanding the risk from climate change, um, better understanding how ecosystems are meeting people's needs. So you have a whole set of targets that are focused on actually the ecosystem services being provided to people and the relationship between people and the environment. And then you have a number of targets also on how do you actually get this done. And so again, how does this information, how does the information from organizations like Geobon feed into understanding the negative impacts of businesses on biodiversity or the, the positive impacts. How does it relate to incentives? How does it relate to sustainable consumption choices? How do we make sure that the data that is being collected in countries has the potential to inform the decision making of people? And I don't know. And how do we also then engage with different communities. And so there are targets related to involving a gender responsive approach, um, to having participatory, inclusive, and representative decision making that involves indigenous populations, but also different people who are across the spectrum of society, um, whether it's youth or older people or people with disabilities. Um, and then there is a target directly related to how do we then ensure that the data information and knowledge for decision making is available. And I, I think that this target is particularly interesting probably for Geobon as well because as you move forward with the idea of building global biodiversity observation networks, how do you track the success of what you're doing? So if we're saying countries should be tracking the success of what they're doing according to biodiversity, then I think as a community, it's also important to track how monitoring systems are functioning and who's using the information, how is information coming into a system, and where are the gaps? And so this is the idea behind 
um, how this target itself would be monitored. So as I mentioned, the real challenge, of course, now is to make sure that this information and this approach is available for countries and that countries are in the driver's seat in terms of developing their targets and implementing the framework um, in a way that works for them and in order to do so that they have the, the knowledge there to make it happen. So I will say, I think other people have shown some of this, but there, there was a lot of press around COP15 and so I think now we have a challenge of maintaining the momentum of making sure that we bring the global biodiversity framework into action, including the monitoring framework. And so I look forward to discussing this with all of you today and, and hopefully later on. Um, and I also wanted to quickly mention, of course, we do have this ad hoc, ad hoc technical expert group on indicators, which a number of GeoBond members are part of um, that is also continuing to work on the indicators and many of these people are also here so um, I would encourage you to help us strengthen this link between this community and the work that's going on to implement the monitoring framework. So thank you all and I will look forward to talking to you later in the week.